Um, so let me formally introduce, I mean, let me formally welcome everybody here. Um, uh, we have really sort of a wonderful group of scholars with coming from diverse backgrounds and, and ranges, and so it's really very exciting to have everybody here. Um, I want to, first of all, begin by um, uh, thanking uh, different institutions for uh, support. Um, so we've been very fortunate to get support from the Center for International Studies, uh, from the Office of the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, from the East Asia Center, um, from the South Asia Center, uh, from the Department of Politics, and from the Tarek Nat Das Foundation. Um, so, uh, um, uh, so uh, I'd also like to say um, that to the extent to which this conference um, achieves a success, um, it's really taken a team to put together an event like this. Uh, and there are some people who actually um, aren't here, who you may or may not run into, um, uh, but uh, who have played an important role, and I want to acknowledge that. Uh, so one person is uh, Sharon Marsh uh, in the Department of Politics office, um, who has been invaluable in many different ways. Um, another person who I'm hoping to actually minimize your contact with um, is Maggie Van Ekren. Uh, Maggie um, is the financial technician that is responsible for this conference. Um, and, uh, and when I say I'm hoping to minimize your interaction with them, it is because uh, the university um, can sometimes be bureaucratic when it comes to dealing with um, financial matters. Um, and so uh, one thing I would like to do is to pass out to people um, who are here and who have a claim, who will have a claim for expenses. I want to pass out um, an instruction for uh, about how you can go about claiming for your expenses. So if you can uh, take one, if it's relevant for you, uh, and have a look at it, I'll, I'll say a few things more about it probably after lunchtime. All right? Okay. Um, uh, so, um, I mentioned Maggie Van Ekren. I also want to mention uh, Jeff Gordon. Uh, Jeff back here. Uh, Jeff is the rapporteur for the, for the conference. Um, and uh, we're hopeful that we will have a report uh, on the conference uh, proceedings uh, by the middle of March. Um, and so I will circulate that to everybody um, as we move forward uh, with this. Um, then uh, I also want to say, just talking a little bit about the schedule for today, um, so we will have two sessions in the morning, uh, and then we will break, uh, and we will take lunch um, uh, walking over to the historic <coughs> academical village of Thomas Jefferson um, and uh, having our lunch in the Colonnade uh, Club, uh, which is part of that academical village. Um, and at that luncheon, um, we will have a number of uh, graduate students, um, undergraduate students. There's even a group from the um, Darden Business School that will come. Uh, and to have you here and for them to have a chance to interact with you is really a, a wonderful thing for them. Uh, they really appreciate it. And, uh, um, and I will also say this, that um, I um, almost always um, end up being impressed with the students that we have here, and I, I hope you will too. Um, we will also, um, before lunch, there's a custom that I actually picked up um, from China, um, which I think is just a wonderful custom, and that is having a group picture for the conference. Um, and so I've arranged uh, before lunch uh, to have a photographer come and have our group picture. So I'm very much looking forward to that. Um, uh, and then uh, after our, our luncheon, um, we will uh, come back here and, and resume the conference. So. I want to say one sort of last comment about um, how I view the focus of this conference. And, and that is that actually I think that this is not really a conference. Right? And you didn't know that, but it's not really a conference. It's, it's really a workshop. Right? Um, that is that um, all of our work is in various stages of, uh, of, of progress. Uh, and um, I really hope that people will feel comfortable to have a, a free-flowing exchange um, uh, where people will feel comfortable to try out their ideas. I know for a fact that um, April and I are going to be a little bit provocative in our presentation. Um, and so I encourage you all to, to, to do so as well. 
Um, so finally, then the last thing I'd like to do is just to have people, um, I, I know many people here already know one another, but not everybody knows um, everybody. So um, if we could just go around the room and if you could just briefly introduce yourself, saying your name and your institutional affiliation, if there's a, a sentence or two you think would be useful for other people to know, um, that would be great. So why don't we start over here with Dale. Um, Dale Copeland, uh, Department of Politics, right across the way here. Uh, I study great power politics. Um, got a book coming out in the fall called Economic, Economic Interdependence and War. So we'll hear more about that. Book. Yeah. Yes. And I'm Jeff Legro, uh, a professor of politics, work on international relations, and um, serving now as vice provost for global affairs. Uh, Steve Cohen, now at Brookings, but spent 34 years at University of Illinois, where he's professor of history and political science, specializing in South Asia. Casey Schaefer. Uh, now uh, a non-resident senior fellow at Brookings, uh, but I spent 30 years in the U.S. Foreign Service, most of it in South Asia. I served in India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and as ambassador to Sri Lanka. Deepa Lovely, uh, research professor of international relations at um, George Washington University, and I also direct a uh, project there called Rising Powers Initiative, and have a recent book, uh, which we'll be, I'll be talking more about on, called Worldviews of Aspiring Powers, not quite great powers like uh, over there, but uh, aspiring. Uh, <coughs> I'm Howard Schaefer. I'm Tazy Schaefer's husband. <laughs> um, I'm a uh, retired U.S. Foreign Service officer, served as ambassador in Bangladesh. Uh, most of my career was spent in South Asia. I spent a total of eight years at the U.S. Embassy in New Delhi, and I'm now teaching at Georgetown University. I'm April Hurlevy. I'm in the Ph.D. program here at UVA, but prior to coming here, I worked primarily in security issues, but my true love is political economy, so I came back here so I could focus on that. April uh, is not only my very capable co-author, but she also has played a, a key role in, in the logistics and organizing all of these events. Um, I'm John Echeverry Gent, and I'm, uh, I, I teach in the Department of Politics, and I work in the area of political economy in South Asia. I'm Mel Leffler. I teach in the History Department here at UVA, and I write about the history of American foreign relations. Good morning. I'm Lily. Um, I'm working with the Chinese Think Tank, uh, China Institute of Contemporary International Relations. Uh, I uh, focus on uh, South Asian studies, especially on uh, China-Indian relations. Hi, my name is Guan Yu. Uh, I'm a visiting faculty in politics at the UVA. Um, uh, I focus on uh, like China and East Asia studies, especially free trade and the uh, regional institution in East Asia. Um, I'm Harry Harding. I'm the dean of the Frank Batten School of Leadership and Public Policy here at UVA. My scholarly career has focused variously on Chinese domestic politics, Chinese foreign policy, U.S.-China relations, international relations with the Asian state of the region. Um, I've been dean now for coming up to five years, and I've learned uh, quite a bit about leadership and public policy. <laughs> and now the hard work is coming to an end, and I'm looking forward to getting back to uh, doing um, what I was trained to do, working on China and uh, Asia and U.S. relations uh, with them. But I also hope to uh, keep alive my new interests in civic leadership and in policy analysis and the challenges of public policy and a global uh, tool. Uh, I'm Tandi Madan. I'm a fellow in the foreign policy program at Brookings. Uh, my work focuses broadly on Indian foreign policy and particularly on India's relations with China and the U.S. Uh, I'm working on a book on the U.S.-India relationship with China. I am Bob Sutter. I'm a professor of practice at the Elliott School at George Washington University. I also direct a program there called the Bachelor of Public Arts in National Affairs Program, uh, and uh, I come at uh, full-time teaching after 10 years at Georgetown and, uh, and 33 years in the U.S. government, uh, about one-third on intelligence issues and two-thirds working for Congress. And I write a lot of books, and uh, the latest book is, uh, is on the United States and Asia. Uh, I'm Ni Shi Xiu uh, from Fudan University, Shanghai, China. Uh, I'm the former dean of uh, Fudan School of International Relations. In fact, I'm uh, one of the first group of Chinese scholars uh, 
uh, doing postdoctoral research at Harvard uh, 34 years ago. Oh, my. <laughs> so ever since then, I've been uh, back to the United States uh, for about 70 times, at least 70 times. <laughs> and uh, so I cherish uh, a deep affection uh, for the American people, the American scholar, <coughs> scholars and students. Uh, I'm very devoted to U.S.-China uh, relations studies, and, and I continue to, to do so, to contribute more to the better relations between China and the United States. Thank you. Ning is also one of the few Chinese professors that knows how to drive a tractor. Right? <laughs> 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 and the clips in the farm. Yes, that's right. <laughs> okay. okay. Well, um, uh, then uh, I'm going to turn the floor over to Mel Leffler, who I've instructed as all chairs to ruthlessly watch the time. Uh, and uh, so, Mel? Okay, well, um, I am going to ruthlessly watch the time because we only have one hour for this first session. And so my introductions will be brief. We have uh, an extremely interesting paper. Um, it's not that often that even before a book appears that we have a frontal assault on it, uh, however, <laughs> however polite and, uh, and respectful, and um, as well as the author here to uh, defend the, the major thesis. So I think we're going to have a very good session. So um, John Echeverry Dent and, and April Herlevy here will present their papers. Each, is, each person is going to speak about 10 minutes, as I understand it. I think uh, you all know John, he's a professor here and has written extensively on comparative politics, political economy of development. Uh, he's written books uh, in terms of comparing the U.S. and India in dealing with, uh, with the poor and a very interesting edited volume on economic reform in China, India, and Russia. Uh, he's now about to publish or finishing a book on capital markets uh, in India. And um, April is writing her dissertation on foreign direct investment in China and its impact on Chinese economic growth and the economic integration of uh, East Asia and the strategic implications of, of that development. So it'll be very interesting to hear the paper. I'll briefly introduce uh, the two um, commentators on the paper, Dale uh, Copeland, um, uh, who's uh, really the subject of this paper in, in, in many respects, is here. Dale uh, wrote a, a terrific book about 15 years about, ago about, on the origins of great power war, and since then has written a series of uh, very influential articles, and his book uh, with Princeton University Press is about to appear on economic interdependence and international conflict, and uh, it's going to have a, a major impact on the field. So it's wonderful to have this opportunity to discuss parts of it today and the, the implications of it. And then uh, Jeff Lebro, who is the uh, vice provost here um, at UVA for global affairs, he used to be chair of the politics department. Many of you know Jeff. He's written extensively, broadly speaking, on cooperation, conflict, and strategy of great powers, as well as on norms in international relations and national identity. And he led a very influential. American Political Science Association report on America's global standing in 2009. So uh, we're really glad that Jeff took the time away from his administrative duties to be here. And I'll turn it over to John and April. All right, I will kick it off then. Um, basically what my role is here this morning is I'm gonna spend about 10 minutes really kind of just setting the stage in terms of the description. Um, it has anyone who saw the paper knows there is an appendix with a range of tables, graphs. That's literally about a third of what we actually put together. So in some ways, we're still sort of sifting through all the data to try to make sense of what does this mean for the future of the relations of these countries. And quite frankly, it's, it's interesting now having sifted through the data to, to think about how do policymakers deal with this. There are important changes. And is that translating into strategic interests, and how are they doing so? 
So what we'll do this morning, I'll, I'll basically talk a little bit about the changes in trade and investment. Um, most of the changes we've seen more along the lines of trade, but we're now beginning to see those changes in investment as well. Um, then I'll sort of shift gears and talk about the bilateral relations. And what we've done for that section is, uh, in the critique, we'll talk about how maybe looking at things bilaterally is not necessarily the best way to do so. But what we've done is pick out a few interesting sort of trends in terms of the economic relationships between these countries. And I'll just briefly cover a, a couple of those points. Um, and then at that time, I'll turn over to my co-author to talk about economic interdependence. And so the, the broader theories and the critiques of those theories. So what have we really sort of discerned from all this looking at the data? So running through the numbers, we went back to 1970, but for most of this paper, we really focused on 1990 is sort of the, the cut point in terms of a comparison to 2012. Um, and you don't really need to look at the data to know some of these trends. We know that uh, aspiring powers, leading powers are much more interdependent. They're much more important in the global economy. Uh, and that has partly been related to the sort of rise of the global south, uh, the sort of rise of the rest. So that we'll show a couple graphics in a moment that sort of show that, that in terms of trade, they're a much more important component and much of that is due to integration. Um, as Mel said, that's really what, what I want to look at in my in, um, dissertation because I think the changing nature of global production is really important to how we understand both the relationship among US, uh, China, and India, but within the region. That's certainly a change from the past. So it, it's easy to see that we're not really in a state of bipolarity anymore. There really is more regional integration and how is that changing strategic interests. So as I said, we just sort of we took a couple graphics uh, just to sort of show the increasing parity. So this is the share of global trade, uh, 1995 and then 2012. And it's, it's sort of amazing that we go from 70% of developed countries sort of as the share of trade to now almost near parity. So it's almost 50-50 in terms of developing and developed countries in terms of their share of trade. Uh, also, just in terms of the global south, as I said, just massive increases for both low and middle income countries. Basically, for middle income countries, we've seen a 13% increase in total trade volume um, from 1994 to 2012, and for low income countries, an 18% increase. So they're rising a lot more, and so they're becoming a more important player, as I said, in these global production networks. In terms of investment, uh, this is inward direct investment as a share of annual inflows. And as you can see, we actually in 2010 reached an inflection point. So now the developing world and transition countries are actually receiving more annual FDI inflows than the developed world. And so that's a major change and sort of unprecedented in some ways that that, that shift. And if anyone's interested, we did also all of these sort of graphics to look at China, India, and the U.S. as a share of GDP, as a share of the world total, to see what those changes are. And, and in some ways, among those three countries now, for instance, in terms of direct investment as a percentage of GDP, there's rough parity in terms of how much reliance on foreign direct investment each country has. There's been less change in terms of outward in out, outward FDI flows, and, that, and that's to be expected in some respect. Obviously, as these economies build, we're likely to see more of that, um, and you pr can't really read the newspaper without hearing about uh, foreign companies from China sort of re looking for resources abroad. So there's, there's increasing outward direct investment, but it hasn't quite reached the parity that we've seen in inward direct investment. Um, we didn't show a slide here, but the other area where there actually hasn't been as much change yet is portfolio investment. That is still primarily dominated by U.S. and Europe ties in sort of financial markets. Uh, it'll be interesting to see over the next decade if that begins to change as well, if there is an increasing share in Asia of portfolio investment, but we have not seen that yet. The last area of sort of general interest, and this is again one you hear in the headlines a lot, is the holdings of foreign currency. So this is looking at the change of, in terms of advanced industrial countries and emerging markets. Now it's over $7 trillion that emerging markets hold in foreign currency reserves. So this is in millions of US dollars, this graphic. Uh, and 
and there's a lot of reasons for that. I won't go into detail, but if we want to talk about that later, I mean, there's a lot of different theories and economics about, about why that is. Why is that so important for a lot of these emerging markets to utilize foreign exchange reserves as their, their way of maintaining their role in the global economy? So in terms of the China and U.S., we sort of we sort of frame this as competition amid, amidst imbalance. So obviously the rhetoric is obviously very competitive between the U.S. and China, but there's this intrigue. You know, as I said, global production has really changed. The the processing trade that China does it's increased. It's going up the technology ladder, but they really can't do it by themselves because it's so integrated in terms of where the components are coming for each of these sorts of products. So we've seen uh, industrial manufacturing sort of exports to China from the U.S. decreasing, but it's not just Chinese exports. It's really integrated with the rest of East Asia, so this idea of processing trade. Uh, again, the macroeconomic link linkages. So China's huge trade surplus equals U.S. debt holding. So what, what do we do about this? There's been several prominent economists who have talked about the idea that this there's imbalances on both sides, and that's partially responsible for the 2008 global financial crisis. And so what does that mean for the future? Obviously, there's been a lot more talk now, even within China, about should, should they try to make the renminbi more of an international currency to sort of deal with this issue that the dollar is the reserve currency of the world. Uh, and the last is really the role of international institutions. Uh, there's still a lot of tension within the World Trade Organization. There's frustration in the U.S. that the Doha round has not gone further. There's a series of, of, series of anti-dumping complaints from the U.S. about China and vice versa. And this, there's been a sort of tendency for a tit-for-tat uh, dumping claims here. And now um, I'll talk about it in a moment. Same thing with intellectual property in India as well. Um, the other issue is sort of IMF reform. There's a, China's been pushing very hard to sort of reform the structure of the IMF, but it's been very slow. And some blame this actually on Congress. You know, President Obama does not want to put forward any of these reforms that would require appropriations to Congress, knowing that not much is going to get done. So there's some frustration there about reform within these international institutions. In terms of India and the U.S., we've sort of framed this as Increasing Indian assertiveness, but a continuing asymmetry in terms of the relations. So the U.S. is very important to India in terms of portfolio investment, FDI, export market, all of these things. But there's increasing tension, as I said, over intellectual property rights. This has particularly been in the case of pharmaceuticals. So Bayer and Pfizer, there's been some patents revoked. And of course, the American business community gets very upset about that and then lobbies Congress wants to do more to sort of stop these intellectual property violations. And that will probably only grow to be a bigger issue over the, over the next decade. Uh, and then in terms of China and India, it's sort of, we, we sort of thought a lot about how, how to frame this, because in some ways the trade patterns between the two countries almost look neo-colonial. So India is exporting raw materials to China, and then China is exporting back industrial manufactured goods. And so it's sort of an interesting relationship, that building. But there's also a lot of opportunity, what we call sort of dynamic development. China has actually proposed to finance about $300 billion of infrastructure investment in India. And that could be really positive, could do a lot for, for needs in India. But is this going to be so, become another sort of asymmetric relationship? Will this create further problems? Will this turn into essentially just resource extraction for China, uh, a claim that's been levied by some about China's relations in in Africa, sort of you know, just going after resources and not caring about much else. So it'll be interesting to see if that sort of dynamic begins to develop between China and India. And actually, at this time, yes, I will turn it over to my co-author. Thank you. Um, so uh, let me. So just sort of setting up the part that I'm going to talk about. Um, what our argument is, is that in fact um, we have a new global order in the sense of the fact that production is becoming much more decentralized. Um, we have more south-south both trade and south-south investment. Um, and so you might say to sum it up that the, um, uh, the pattern of the international global economy has moved from a sort of wheel and spoke type pattern with the United States um, and, uh, and Europe 
states or former colonial powers at the center and developing countries at the ends of the spokes to a much more sort of matrix type of, 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 of situation where there's much more horizontal linkage, right? So that's basically the thrust of our argument and April's done a great job in presenting a lot of the data along those lines. Um, so um, we uh, now then want to say, well, in light of that argument, in some of the changes that we've noticed in terms of bilateral relationships. So what does this all mean for our thinking about, um, uh, about uh, economic interdependence? And there actually is a long history of thinking about economic interdependence, um, going at least as far back as Montesquieu, um, uh, who has sort of famously enunciated the do commerce or uh, theory of economic interdependence, where economic interdependence um, brings peace. Uh, and uh, um, on the other hand, um, you could go as far back as Marx, and when he talks about primitive accumulation, he talks about how it's really violence that undergirds the spread of global markets. Um, so um, we, in our, uh, in our discussion, we divide up um, uh, this into three different models. All right? uh, and we can go through the first two pretty quickly. We'll spend a little bit more time on the third. So, um, the first two models are the liberal model and the realist model, um, and then uh, I want to spend a little more time talking about um, uh, uh, Dale Copeland's sort of forthcoming book in the model that he promotes. Um, because while we have some criticisms of it, um, uh, on the other hand, it clearly advances our agenda, um, and we wouldn't be able to even think um, in the terms that we are thinking without building on what Dale has already written. So let's just talk briefly um, about the liberal and realist model. So the liberal model, um, sort of drawing from uh, Montesquieu um, and even earlier uh, thinkers, um, basically argues that trade leads to specialization um, and complementarity between economies. So very similar to David Ricardo's sort of theory of comparative advantage. Um, and that these provide benefits to all trading partners. Right? Um, also trade, by promoting specialization, leads to adjustment um, uh, and uh, within the economy, and together these benefits and the adjustments create um, opportunity costs. So um, to disrupt the benefits gained from, uh, from uh, global trade um, imposes high opportunity costs, therefore it discourages um, uh, actors uh, from, uh, or countries from, uh, from uh, engaging in conflict. And we add to this sort of a domestic dimension of the liberal theory, which is that trade creates domestic actors um, that have an interest um, in, in international conflict and that want to lobby in order to maintain uh, um, uh, free trade uh, and avoid conflict. So for all those reasons, the liberal model basically predicts that the more trade you have, the less likely you're going to have conflict. Now, let's turn to the realist model. Um, so under the realist model, um, states are viewed as rational, unitary actors uh, that are motivated primarily to maximize security um, in a world of anarchy. Um, in this framework, trade is viewed as creating vulnerabilities um, uh, that um, threaten security. And so states either avoid trade, or if they're compelled um, to trade, um, they oftentimes act aggressively to control resources or to preempt the rise of, of other states, of, of, of other rival states. So in contrast to the liberal theory, under the realist theory, the idea is that trade actually is more likely to lead to conflicts. Right? So um, now uh, we want to talk a little bit about um, uh, Dale's uh, uh, theory, uh, what he calls uh, trade expectation theory. Um, so Dale follows from the realist premises, and he says that he views states as rational, unitary actors um, in a world characterized by relative gains. So, um, uh, so states are, are concerned about the distribution of gains, um, as opposed to in the liberal theory where there's more of a concern for the ideas that trade brings absolute gains. Everybody benefits in expanding some gain. So, Dale then, where he begins his real contribution is to talk about um, economic interdependence um, as involving strategic interaction between trading partners. And this strategic interaction creates contingent and variable outcomes. So in contrast to the liberal and realist theory that basically say trade produces peace or trade produces um, conflict, what Dale is saying is that well, it depends. Trade can produce, in some cases, peace, in 
some cases conflict, um, and it really depends on the strategic interaction between trading partners. Um, and um, that strategic interaction is grounded fundamentally in the future expectations that the different partners have. All right? So um, they anticipate, um, and their preferences and strategies flow from their um, anticipation of what their trading partners are going to do. Um, and so, um, basically, uh, to simplify, um, what Dale says is, um, if a trading partner engages in aggressive um, behavior, um, then the other partner is likely to also respond um, with protective measures and, in some cases, with aggressive uh, behavior. And so you get um, a trade security spiral that, um, uh, that um, ultimately will um, uh, uh, culminate in conflict. Furthermore, you have uh, what Dale has called the shadow of the future, all right? Um, uh, problem of the future. Pardon? The problem, the problem of the future, yes. I, I've, I've shadowed your uh, problem. That's the old one. <laughs> yeah, all right. Um, the problem of the future, um, uh, where um, other states um, that are engaged in trade, trading partners, they might renege um, on their trading commitments, um, or, um, they, uh, uh, or their leaders might be replaced. Um, or um, trade ha might have an endogenous dynamic um, where it creates um, external uh, dependence, altering the balance of power, um, and all those could possibly precipitate conflict. Okay? So, um, uh, once again, um, strategic interaction to the extent to which different trading partners um, are committed to long-term uh, trading, um, it's likely to produce peace. Um, however, um, if the strategic interaction uh, leads to a trade security spiral, well, then it's likely to end up in conflict. Right. So what do we have to say about, the, about um, this theory, um, aside that it advances um, our thinking a lot? Well, um, first of all, one of the things we found is that um, <coughs> trade expectations theory, while it allows for a role of finance in terms of affecting the costs and benefits. It really, from our view, doesn't adequately um, conceptualize the interrelationship between finance and trade. All right? So everybody here around the table knows that, the, that the China is a big financer. Of, um, uh, it's actually the largest foreign holder of, uh, of U.S. government uh, securities. Um, and China is really financing what otherwise would be an unsupportable trade imbalance. Right? This is really important. Similarly, in the case of uh, China's relations with India, um, China looks like it's about ready to roll, to take out its wallet um, and bankroll the huge, we're talking about 57% of total Sino-Indian trade um, is accounted for by the imbalance. right? So China has this huge imbalance with India as well. Um, and uh, just earlier this month, um, it um, expressed a willingness to pay for um, $300 billion in infrastructural finance, which is 30% of all Indian infrastructural finance in the 12th five-year plan. Right? So this is a major move that they're offering. Um, this is in addition to offering to set up industrial centers, um, et cetera. Um, so this is another huge um, uh, relationship that bears looking into that if we just think about in the, the basic structure of trade um, uh, expectations theory, um, we think it, it, it bears independent analysis uh, more so than, than what is allowed. And it, for a country like India, it poses a real challenge. Will India be more like Africa, which also has been bankrolled by China, um, in basically being a source of resource extraction but not much investment? Or will, in fact, India be able to leverage this investment um, to become its own sort of trading power, to hook up with a Asian production, uh, global commodity change, Asian production networks? Um, so this is a huge issue that bears um, uh, looking into. All right, second critique um, is that we think that as the global economy changes, as there are growing horizontal linkages, as there are growing regional associations, I call them sort of horizontal associations. Um, thinking about interdependence in bilateral terms is increasingly limited. Now, to be fair to Dale, um, he does, uh, in uh, um, uh, the last uh, quarter of his article, talk about third parties. Right? But for him, third parties um, are exogenous actors. They're, so they involve exogenous shocks. And we think that that's 
in the context of the changing global order, inadequate. First of all, we've talked about, and, and actually um, Harry Harding has written about uh, the U.S., India, and, uh, um, and China as a strategic triangle. Um, and uh, we hope that our bilateral discussion of bilateral relations highlights that. But furthermore, more than that, we have other countries that play an increasingly important role. So just to take one example, um, Japan has very has made a, a, a strong commitment um, to, to India. Um, it's the largest financer of foreign uh, assistance in India, um, but also it has growing investments in India. Um, and it's clearly playing a role balancing uh, China uh, in India, uh, uh, with India. Um, and that very much affects India's relations with China. We feel that these horizontal relations um, need to be uh, incorporated into the analysis as well. Finally, um, is the question, Dale's approach, um, in a way, uh, uh, at least in, in the model, um, sort of talks about future expectations, but we feel it doesn't do an adequate job in explaining where future expectations come from. Right? Um, and our argument, to be provocative, is as, um, uh, as interdependence becomes more multilateral as opposed to bilateral, um, as it becomes more complex, Basically, the process of forming expectations about the future becomes decoupled increasingly, more loosely coupled, perhaps I should say, um, uh, uh, from international economic relations. So there's the, the, um, uh, uh, the argument that sort of structures don't produce instruction sheets. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and we feel that as there's greater complexity of interdependence, um, there's less clear guidelines as to how countries should respond. At the same time, um, we feel that increased international interdependence strengthens the influence of domestic actors who have an interest. Um, and these domestic actors, think of it this way, the more countries, and we have strong data um, that shows that countries are, uh, all the countries we're looking at have vastly increased involvement in the global economy. China, it's clear. India, I think its global involvement is underappreciated. Few people here know that the share of trade in, uh, in India, as its share of the GDP, is actually today higher than the share of trade uh, to GDP in China. Right? But that is, in fact, the case, and that's been the case for the last couple of years. Um, uh, and so, um, and so uh, the idea of increased um, uh, interdependence um, strengthening domestic actors, and those actors may have um, uh, may support um, uh, trade, but they may also be affected, displaced by trade. Um, nonetheless, the whole point is it increases the salience and importance of domestic uh, actors. Finally, um, uh, we argue that domestic political institutions and processes um, are likely to play an increasingly important role um, in the contingent construction of, of interests and strategies. So the argument is that actually interests and strategies are much more contingent than what we might think from a more uh, rational choice uh, model. So let's conclude. In light of the changing global order, we're arguing that we need to think more um, and reflect more upon the increasingly important relationship between economic interdependence and strategic interests. Um, and um, we think that, uh, in fact, um, it's a, an appropriate occasion to gather a group of scholars who have some expertise in that matter. So now it's your job. Thanks very much, though. It's a really stimulating paper. Uh, Dale? Uh, I think I go uh, first? it's appropriate All right. to <laughs> respond. I do have 12 minutes, so keep me to that. Uh, I'll try to be brief. Uh, this is an excellent paper, and I love all the statistics. I mean, it's like a real eye-opener. I just, I actually didn't even read a lot of the, I mean, I read the whole paper, but I read, <laughs> no, 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 hold on, hold on. I, I actually, I literally read all of this first, because I wanted to see what I would think of the statistics before I read their interpretation. I didn't want to be biased. But let me just say that I largely agree with their descriptive picture. I mean, how they interpret the evidence, this idea of a complex multilateral world, uh, you know, a lot of horizontal associations, uh, and so forth. Um, this matrix picture in a general sense. But let me say what I think is perhaps problematic. Um, it's not that I disagree with the descriptive picture, but I want to ask two questions. How stable is that picture? In other words, is it, what is it? What does it depend upon and 
and where is it going to go? Is it going to stay that way? Is it going to get stronger or not? And more importantly, to what extent is that picture itself a function of China's grand strategy and therefore about China's dealing with the great power, pro great power politics problem of relationships with the U.S. and other states in an anarchic world. And this is where I think the paper um, lets itself down. What I would argue is that if you step back and look at China's strategy over the last oh, 30 years, but especially after Deng Xiaoping's 24-character speech in the early 90s about hiding our claws, biding our time, avoiding trying to look like we're a, a new leader in the world system, and just grow through trade, it's a fascinating strategy because it's a classic strategy of, a, of an inferior but rising power that wants to grow through trade and interlink itself, like Japan after 1870, interlink itself precisely to get the trade and technology it needs to become an even better great power into the future and perhaps even you know, rise to the top of the system. So we have to, I think we have to get, in, get into a certain, certain cynical view here, not cynical in the sense that this is all going to go to hell. I, I'm actually very much an optimist. If you read the sort of last chapter of my book, I'm very much an optimist, but for very different reasons. So let me tease out what I think is really going on here in the world trade system. What really is going on in my mind is that, yes, the Chinese would like to see this matrix continue, um, but actually, if you really think about it, the old hub and spoke system that fo focused on the U.S., in great power terms, that was a great sphere strategy vis-a-vis -vis the Soviet Union during the Cold War. You have everyone come to us, basically. China wants to do the same in its own sphere. It wants to create a sphere. So let's not think, oh, hub-and-spoke U.S. versus matrix. Let's think dual hub-and-spoke systems. China trying to create a, an, an alternative to the U.S. system and therefore have small powers in its own region and around the world and in Africa and so forth come to it. I have dependent relationships, but it's doing it in a very different way from this sort of neo-mercantilist logic of the Soviet Union. And that's a good reason for positive optimism in the future. But here's what I think is really going on. Uh, I'm going to draw upon a, a bad joke here. If you've seen the movie The Matrix, you know that people are in this delusion, and then they, pop, they take a pill and they pop out of the Matrix, and they see reality, and it's not so pretty. Well, they talk about a matrix, and I think it's, not, it's a delusion. It's not a delusion in the sense that it's not descriptively real. It's that the foundations for it are based around the blue pill. And if you take the red pill, you'll actually see what's really going on. Uh, so here's what's going on, I is think. Is the red pill your book? The red pill is my book. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that the good pill? I can't remember the movie. It's been 10 years. Uh, <laughs> okay, so here's what I think is really going on. Imagine China's dilemma. We want to build our power like Japan after the Meiji Restoration through trade. We want to engage the system, but we want to join all these institutions, Ian Johnson, join all these institutions so that people aren't as worried about this rising power. Hey, we're responsible. We're not like the Soviets. We're a responsible, f r largely free trading state that wants to be engaged. We've joined all the inst institutions so that they can bide their time and build their power. That's the larger grand strategy. Here's the dilemma, though, that great powers face. And this is where I'm very much different than Mearsheimer. Mearsheimer thinks, well, if you get that relative gain, uh, you know, that's great, but the other side's going to cut you off. Well, no, but because the U.S. says to itself, hey, if we can keep China relatively moderate through trade and keep its expectations positive, we can bind China to the system and keep it moderate for the long term. So that's the U.S. incentive. But here's the, here's the rub. The Chinese, like the Japanese, also understand that the, the state that gets that relative gain is also the state becoming more vulnerable, vulnerable to cutoffs, vulnerable to the, to the resource dependencies, the oil in particular, but all resource dependencies around the world. And ironically, the very growth of that rising power re depletes resources at home and increases dependency abroad. China's gone from being a net exporter, 1992, of oil, to now 55% of its oil comes from abroad, 75% in another 10 to 15 years. China is obsessed with the oil dependency problem. Almost all the books I've read have suggested this. And they're particularly obsessed with the Malacca Straits problem, as they call it, which is well, somewhere 75% of their oil comes through the Malacca Straits controlled by, guess who, India, not really, but Indian Ocean, and, of course, the U.S. Now, here's the, here's the rub for the Chinese. They know that the U.S. has them, quote, over a barrel, if you will. The U.S. has leverage because of its very 
dependence, the Chinese dependence on this raw material, uh, the raw materials and oil. And so they have to play it cool. They have to play it relatively cautious. They, want to, don't, they don't want to rock the boat as they're growing and rising. The U.S. has that incentive to keep China bound up so that it will stay moderate. But the tension in the system is what, is what is actually likely to cause these two states to give up this wonderful trading environment and having these positive expectations? Well, from the China perspective, they want to be very cautious. They're in a situation not like the multipolar world of the 18, 1880s or 1890s. They're in a, in a largely bipolar or really hegemonic order conventionally where if they start to push hard with the Navy into the Indian Ocean and start moving their, their, uh, their Navy around the Africa, they're going to get a backlash. They're going to create what I call this trade security spiral, whereas they push hard with their Navy perhaps into Africa and Asia and Middle East, the U.S. will respond with cutoffs, restrictions, Malacca Strait, you know, dilemmas, and so forth, that will lead the Chinese to do more things that might lead to a spiral of misunderstanding in a new Cold War. Nobody wants that. Nobody wants a repeat of the 30s. Nobody wants a repeat of the 1940s and 50s. So China wants to stay moderate, but it wants to hedge its bets as well. It wants to make sure, since how can we rely on you know, the Obama administration? What if the next Republican administration wants to play real containment, real containment? They're going to say, well, let's hedge our bets. Let's diversify for one thing. That, so that's a pretty important strategy. Diversify pipelines everywhere, uh, you know, pipelines across the Karakor Mountains and through Burma, reduce the Malacca State's you know, leverage problem. That's an important strategy. Build a little bit of a navy, not so much, but enough to say, hey, we could do this. Tell the Indians, we like your relationship, but you know, don't push us around. And we have some economic leverage over you. So we, if we detach, and this is what I find problematic with the paper, if we detach the economic side from the geopolitical side, we get a kind of a rosy picture of horizontal linkages, and we forget that the Chinese are actually desiring that because it helps them reduce, it helps them to diversify, reduce the direct dependence on the U.S., and at the same time create a new hubs and spokes where those smaller states, including India, are actually very dependent on China's largesse, you know, niceness, and so forth. Now, why is that all important? Well, because one of the things that the Chinese would like to do as they keep growing, they know that the next Republican administration might say, China threat, China threat. They want to make sure that if they, the next Republican administration starts you know, playing the China threat card, they want to have a diversified strategy for one thing, but they want this matrix, as you're calling it, I call it a hub and spokes, they want this hub and spokes uh, regional strategy to work so that the U.S. can't do COCOM can't do CHICOM, can't do the con economic containment strategy that was so effective during the Cold War. Why can't it do it? Very simply. These other small states, it's not, it's not the 1940s and 50s. These other states see China as a good thing, as something that helps them grow economically and maintain domestic stability. We want to stay you know, trading with China. We won't go along. If the U.S. says, let's do a new CHICOM or COCOM, we're not going to go along with that, say, well, the other states will say. And then they'll say, China's threat? You've got to be kidding me. China's not a threat. It's not the Stalinistic era of the 1950s where you needed a COCOM. So the actual strategy that China is adopting, if you can see my picture here, is one of a brilliant buying time for future growth, diversification, and maintaining dependent relationships where they have the leverage over the smaller states even if the U.S. still has some leverage over them. And that, what it does is it diffuses the U.S. ability to play the containment card and use that as leverage in any way, shape, or form. The downside of all of this is geography. The Chinese have a d dilemma of the Navy being having to go still through the Malacca Straits regardless if it ever comes pushed, push comes to shove. They don't have the beautiful U.S. relationship of 1943, where we're becoming, U.S. 1943, we're becoming dependent on outside sources of oil. We'll just move our, our Navy into the Middle East and take it over. Thank you very much, Britain. Well, you know, the Chinese you can't do that. So they understand that the relationship is not the rosy, wonderful world of the U.S. rise to great power you know, status by 1945. We take over the world and we run it for ourselves. The Chinese can't do that. So they play it, the cautious, Deng Xiaoping, 24-character strategy. All right, now let me finish up here uh, with my rant. Uh, <laughs> uh, the last 
thing I would want to say about this is why I'm optimistic. Why am I optimistic? It sounds pessimistic, right? I'm optimistic because states <coughs> that are rational, and I think both sides are, not only learn from history, so they don't want to repeat the 1930s in Pearl Harbor, they don't want to repeat uh, the Stalinistic period. So what, what is China's strategy? It's not to create a co-prosperity sphere. They create hubs and spokes through free trade, relatively speaking, right? But not through political dominance in the empire sense. And that makes those states not only want to trade with China, but it, it, it assuages the fears that China is going to create a neo-mercantilist sphere like the Soviet Union could have and tried to create Eastern Europe, obviously, but if Western Europe went communist, that would have drawn the Western Europeans into a, a neo-mercantilist sphere. That's wonderful because that keeps U.S. trade expectations relatively positive, and therefore U.S. has relatively speaking, not much reason to go with the economic containment route, let alone political military. Now, that's one thing that's good. You might add in that the U.S. is a liberal, you know, you know, this is John Eikenberry, liberal state that loves to trade and have free trade. I personally think it's bullshit, but <laughs> because the U.S. was the most neo-mercantilist state for 45 years of the Cold War. It, it implemented a spherical strategy that was hegemonic only in, in its own realm, and it was deliberately designed to cut off the Soviet Union from trade with the world. So it wasn't liberal and wonderful in a global sense. It was only that way with its sphere. But the U.S. now is also constrained from implementing a full-out COCOM, CHICOM kind of strategy, and that's a reason for optimism. The U.S. knows that it can't do it again, or at least as effectively, because there'd be a lot of defections from a CHICOM, but they also understand that the, if they've learned anything from history, they learned that if they start cutting off states from raw material access, Japan 1940-41, that state's going to react, and you're going to get into a trade security spiral that could lead to not necessarily nuclear war, obviously, but reactions that spiral into sort of Cuban Missile Crisis kinds of, or Berlin maybe, Berlin Crisis kinds of scenarios. Both sides don't want that. Both sides have a reason not to invoke the spiral. So what's the bottom line here? Well, if you step back and look at the geopolitical strategies that both sides are using, how both sides understand that the liberals have something going for them, that is, good trade relations can keep the peace if the expectations are positive, then they want to keep those expectations positive and use diplomacy to reassure each other about the future trade environment. That's very nice. The underlying rub is this dependency that China's building up from below through its you know, resource grabbing or resource desires that give China this queasy feeling, you might say, about the future. What if you know, the Malacca Straits is, is blocked for piracy reasons or something you know, ridiculous? Uh, what if the, the Americans decide under a future administration to somehow leverage, our, leverage themselves against us uh, or leverage at least our dependency for you know, issues on Taiwan or whatever. That's a concern. China, therefore, will probably do this moderate, I would call it moderate hedging, diversification, a moderate naval buildup, and so forth, just to sort of say, we're, we're, we're there. We're there, and we're not going to be pushed around. But the reason for, main reason for optimism is that China's hub-and-spoke strategy, and again, if you get out of the delusion of the matrix and focus on hubs and spokes in the, in the, West, in, in the East Asian theater, and that includes using our foreign currency reserves to leverage Africa. Let's not forget what those foreign currency reserves are so great for. It's, okay, okay. So that bottom line is, you know, it's a, it's a fascinating paper. I love the statistics. And I, I kind of agree with the descriptive notion, but I think it's, it's not founded on why it's like that. What's the reason for this description? And bottom line, it can only last if both sides geopolitically keep this optimism going. Jeff, please. So if I understand my position, I'm commenting on Dale Copeland commenting on John and April commenting on Dale Copeland. Is that correct? Beautiful <laughs> <laughs> summary. <laughs> that sounds fair. I have my mission right here. That sounds fair. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I, I thought I was going to be the warm-up band for the rock star, um, but, but I'm actually following him. But I, I do want to say that if you read Dale's book, um, it, it is a rock star book. It's going to be a great volume, and, um, and, uh, uh, and I'm thrilled to be uh, attached to it, uh, in, 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 even in this panel. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit. I, I take it, John, this, this is kind of a collective project that may become an edited volume. So I'm going to talk about what that volume's about a little bit and, and how the paper connects to it. 
So I see the kind of main theme as about how conflict and cooperation operate in the modern world order, especially in the cauldron of broader Asia, where there seems to be compelling incentives for both among these three powers operating there. And the question is, is what happens with these things, right? How do we make sense of these, these incentives for both? And um, John and April's paper paints a world, it seems to paint a world of interdependence that leads to cooperation, um, uh, but maybe not, right? So the fundamental questions I think the project is maybe addressing is, is this dynamic of cooperation and conflict different than patterns we've seen in the past? Are we in a new era? And what are the consequences of these new patterns? Um, and if John and April are right, Dale's argument, <coughs> novel and interesting though it is, does not see much new. These states will make decisions much the way they did for centuries based on future expectations of positive benefits. If they don't see the benefits or, or fear being cut off from access to trade and investment, conflict is likely. If positive, a growing cooperative world order is possible. They see Dale as more pessimistic. Dale says he's not pessimistic. And uh, though, though Dale has used uh, Richard Rosecrans as a, as a kind of, um, uh, you know, uh, a straw man in a certain sense, I, their, their conclusions about the world order seem actually fairly similar. That is, the positive benefits of trade outweigh um, the cost of conflict, Correct. and therefore, it's basically going to be a peaceful world. Although with, with Dale's pi picture, there's always that <laughs> asterisk, right? Yeah, it's the that, yeah, yeah, there's the <laughs> right, yeah, and we don't know when that's going to flip. Um, and John and April see a different world than Dale, or do they? It's not really clear, actually. Um, but they make three uh, three points. One, interdependence is more intricate today and, and, then, and therefore less easy, easy to destabilize because it involves both trade and finance, which in their account seem to offset each other, causing mutual dependencies. So it's almost as if they paint a picture of the economic realm of one of mutual assured recession, that any unwinding of these relationships will lead to a spiraling down of the whole system, which neither want to contemplate, right? Mutual assured recession. They believe domestic political processes will matter in ways unexpected by Dale's analysis, which to be fair, Dale anticipates domestic politics are going on. He just mm -hmm. anticipates they will produce certain regular things. And I think uh, John and April see them doing things that are different. That is, the openness they point to of the U.S. system allows transnational actors to reshape interest in ways you wouldn't understand. So. I think to make that argument really bite, you've got to say, tell a story, and maybe you want to use, for example, the U.S.-India nuclear deal and how the transnational lobby produced an outcome that would have been fundamentally different had there not been access of Indian political actors to the system. I think you can actually make a case for that, right? Um, Dale would want to say why, why his argument would totally predict that same outcome. Um, not clear to me if he can do so, but maybe. Uh, they also point out that India's political system and national history hinders rational adaptation to the global environment. Basically, it's hard to explain from a rational strategic actor's perspective why India is so pathologically non-adapted to, to the economic and strategic environment in front of them. They could be um, massively doing better economically by changing certain laws that would open up, open up their economic system to much faster economic growth, and they have not done so. Hence. We cannot understand that from a strategic framework, um, is, is their argument, I think. And they argue Copeland is a framework based on a dyadic logic that cannot accommodate a triad dynamic that is so important and current today. Okay, so here are the implications or thoughts I have about the broader project. It's about uh, the paper in a certain sense, but maybe it's about the project as well. Uh, the first is it's not sure where John and April come down because they do not offer a logic of the trends they see and how those trends connect to whether we should expect increasing cooperation and interdependence or whether we should expect uh, conflict, right? So there's nothing in that paper about that. And maybe the aim of the, is the project that, uh, is to make sense of that. The second is, is they point, uh, they highlight the self-self um, um, connections, but 
actually don't make much of that in the argument. I think it's actually quite interesting, and it would be, it, I think there should be more about how is that different? Does it change geopolitical uh, implications, right? Um, that, that got my attention, and maybe the papers will do that more. Third, um, if, if they're right and the triadic analysis is important, that is not reflected in their paper or the structure of the, of the project. Um, uh, there's surprisingly very little about how triadic dynamics matter in their paper, uh, and the whole structure of the product project is about dyads, so maybe Harry Harding is going to tie it up with triads, or maybe each paper, dis I have not gone through each paper yet at this point, so maybe each paper discusses the triadic logic, but if it's important, you would want to see it shot through not only your paper, but also uh, the project as well. Um, fourth, um, I think there needs to be more attention to the nature and interaction of the two spheres of, that, of this project. You've presented one sphere, Dale's presented the other, although Dale's is a, is a combination of both spheres, uh, uh, you know, very uh, sensitive attention to economic and military uh, factors in Dale's, but your paper does not do that, right? So, but it seems like these spheres are quite important, um, and it's interesting, um, that economic is kind of framed in the realm of interdependence and cooperation where strategic or military connotes rivalry and conflict. But you could almost reverse the title of the project and call it economic rivalry and military interdependence. It makes just as not much sense, if not more. Um, just like there is mutual assured recession, there is mutual assured destruction. And I'm, I'm, I'm amazed that neither your paper or Dale touched on the, the importance of nuclear weapons and all the dynamics that are going on and what is likely to happen in the future. Mm. Um, not only that, but below nuclear weapons, weapons production chains are becoming increasingly entangled in this matrix of economic interdependence, also very significant to what goes mm. on in these, in these countries. So we know that mutual assured destruction and mutual assured recession are related in this area. The U.S.-India nuclear deal, in, in a probably a funny way, was no doubt funded by Chinese uh, purchases of uh, U.S. treasuries. Okay, if you think it through, um, it's probably connected there at some point. Um, so there is this dynamic going on that's linking these two dynamics, and that's you know my, my summary comment. Um, 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 uh, well, let me make one more point before, the, before I get to the summary comment. I was intrigued by uh, just one, something you mentioned, Dale, about the logic of small powers in the region. Um, and it, it's, it, it, it just strikes me that all of these three powers are, are engaged um, in this dynamic, but there's an audience they're playing in front of. They're all competing for influence among the string of, uh, of countries that run from um, Japan uh, through India. Uh, and um, um, that dynamic is not simply these small countries wanting to attach themselves to China. They're being very strategic, independent, the max themselves, themselves playing true. both off. And it's not clear how that, those, those um, uh, hubs will operate. And right. India's been part of that as well. So my summary comment is, the triad, uh, triadic relations with the regional audience and the two issue areas uh, and their interaction are at the heart of the matter. And those are the things that have to be connected of, is this a robust system or a house of cards? Oh. Those are great comments, really.